tour of Empire fighting fronts, His Majesty the King arrives at the 1st Canadian Corps in Italy. Welcomed by Sir Henry Maitland Wilson, 8th Army Commander, His Majesty takes the salute. Major John Mahoney is invested with the Victoria Cross. Major Mahoney is the second VC of the Canadian Army in Italy. His Majesty comes from Normandy, where he inspected the Canadians fighting in the Western invasion area. He finds the same exuberant spirit among the veterans in Italy that he encountered among their brothers in arms in France. Gunners and guns of a medium regiment, Royal Canadian Artillery, are inspected. An important part of the firepower which blasted the way for Canadian infantry through the Hitler line and other formidable objectives. The tank crews who distinguished themselves in the early days of the Corps' formation parade their long line of armor for the King's review. The King is confident of success. He looks to the day when the giant nutcracker will exert sufficient pressure from the west and south to smash the Nazi shell. Canadians supply vital force on both sides of the trap to aid in the final collapse. In England, the Ordnance Corps' new outdoor stadium is officially open. Tommy Farr, Steve Donahue, and other sporting celebrities are present for the dedication. The sports committee have arranged an interesting two-hour card of events. They are witnessed by 3,000 soldiers and their friends in the outdoor amphitheater at the bottom of a natural valley. In one of the curtain raisers, Al McGimpy of Montreal takes on Tony Roberts of Winnipeg. Outpointing McGimpy, Roberts takes this snappy event handily. The crowd endorses the decision. Tommy Farr steps into the ring to handle three bouts. The main event is between two former Golden Gloves champs, Gunner Harry Balta of Montreal and Andy Ross of Niagara Falls. Farr is a popular favorite of the evening. He's the only man to stay with Joe Lewis for 15 rounds in a championship fight. Farr has boxed 278 exhibition fights for Canadians. It's cheers for Baltan, the winner, and for the referee. The autograph hounds descend in force on the champ and his pal, Steve Donahue, world-famous jockey. On the heels of the 1st Canadian Army's formation in the field, the tactical picture in France clarifies. It develops into a grand encirclement of von Kluge's 7th German Army. American troops form the lower jaw of a grand pincer's movement. The 1st Canadian Army and the Caen sector, forming the other jaw, make preparations for a large-scale breakthrough. Their objective is to close the gap at the strongly held German fortress town of Pelais. The disposition of enemy forces is plotted by aerial reconnaissance. Spies seek out and report signs of enemy movement. While units are forcing their way down the Caen Falais Highway, all Canadian elements are briefed preparatory to a mass drive by armor and infantry. Every commander calls his officers and men into frequent conference. In this way, every man knows the rapidly changing tactical picture. Last, the movement order arrives. The full weight of Canadian armor maneuvers into a position of readiness for the all-out drive. Enemy forces are being methodically whittled down by endless barrages. 
Relentlessly, the Allied forces close in on the escape gap of the German army. The Canadian steamroller forges ahead. Layer after layer of stubbornly contested defense lines crumble as it advances astride the Palace Highway. The twin-pronged threat pounds into submission town after town. Soon, Canadian spearheads are in sight of their objective, Palace. Von Kluge desperately tries to retire his outmaneuvered army from the trap. A Canadian column moves off to the left and brings under fire his only main escape route, the Palais Lisieux Highway. While General Patton's 3rd American Army is closing the gap from the south, Canadian armor surges forward, leaving behind pockets of futile resistance. Like great fists, the tank drives smash the breath from the enemy's body. Enemy retirement becomes a rout. Some panzer units dribble through under cover of darkness. Infantry units are left to die or surrender. German 89th Infantry Division fall into our hands. After a terrific mauling by Canadian infantry early in the attack, 2,000 men from this division alone give up. During the battle, an American Liberator gets out of control. With two motors dead, the pilot is unable to land it. After the crew bails out, Typhoon shoot it down over open ground. It cracks up without damage to surrounding buildings. planes carry on the job. Finally, the crust of enemy resistance is broken. Canadians and British fight their way into the suburbs of Palais. The town is a mass of ruins from our aerial bombardment. It is necessary to fight for it street by street. Fanatical Nazi snipers still try to hold up our advance. in our hands, the encirclement is complete. In utter confusion, the Nazis attempt every means of escape. There are but two means left, imprisonment or death. Soon the police pocket is eliminated. Our armies turn to drive to a greater objective, the borders of the Reich itself. <laughs> <laughs> 